Okay, Lenny, so this is, a, it's called the Blindfold Challenge, and it's just, it's just meant to be um, a vehicle for us to listen to some cool tunes together. I've had people who have been terrified of this. We've lost sleep the night before for some reason, but oh, we, well, they shouldn't. Understand. No, and then they, it ends up like, oh, that was really fun. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> number one. When I woke up this morning, things were looking bad. Oh. That's a no-brainer. <laughs> one of my heroes, John Prime. Yeah. Yeah, I realized I was having. <laughs> but fortunately, I have the key to escape reality. And if I see you tonight with an illegal smile, I know that. So the album is uh, John Prine's debut album, of course, and it came out in 1971. I wore I wore that one down to the nub. I knew that John Prine was one of your heroes, and he COVID took John Prine this year. So sad to have lost such a, a great artist. Um, I saw his last concert in Halifax not long before he passed. And it was, yeah, it was great to be there. Did you ever get to meet John Prine? Never did, and that's a sad thing. I would like to have met him. Yeah. So this album came out in 1971. So you were you were young. I was young. Let's just yeah. say that. <laughs> was it was it inspiring? Uh, was it inspiring for you? Did you want it, like I want to be a songwriter like John Prine? Yeah, it, it was very inspiring. I mean, you know, his songs are they're deceptively simple. You know, uh, his uh, for a budding songwriter, the song it wasn't terribly difficult to learn the, the parts, but you know, but uh, just the way he he uh, could could uh, play with melody and words, and, uh, it, it was uh, it was a real uh, a real good uh, place to start from, you know, if you're if you're interested in being a songwriter. See, that was a nice icebreaker, right, for the. <laughs> Okay, ready for number two? Okay. Uh, that's really hard. <laughs> that's a real hard one. I know that already. Come on. You're, not, you're taking it easy on me here. Listen to a few minutes of... He's hidden just above his t-shirt sleeve. With a broken heart and the inscription reads No love songs if you please. Uh, it's a nice duet with you and Ron. <laughs> well, it's only cheeky time. He stands up, he sings for everything. He's a man of a thousand songs. <laughs> oh, Guido. Yeah, now you're taking it easy on me so far, but that's okay. But of of course, the, the late, great Ron Hines. Well, um, yeah. being I, from Newfoundland, I am a huge Ron Hines fan and uh, very sad to have lost Ron in 2015. And uh, I, 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 when I was re when I was going through your stuff, I, I found your tune, Goodbye to Ron Hines. I'd forgotten that you'd, that you'd done a tribute song to Ron. Um, you toured with Ron. And in fact, you played a triple bill at the Vogue. I did see you uh, with Ron Hines and Cashton at the Vogue as well, around oh, cool. probably the year or two later after the Rollins Cross gig. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. But yeah, I played I played a number of shows with Ron, song circles and stuff. And we always, when we were friends and we always threatened to write together, you know, to write a song. And, and it still may happen because he gave me he gave me an idea for a song that's been percolating in the back of my mind. I may get it written one of these days. I remember sending him a verse and he sent it back and and then he got really ill and, and uh, we never finished. But, never but that song I wrote for him, yeah, that uh, I went to his funeral in in, in St. John and St. John's and and uh, it was an amazing event. Uh, you know, it was, it was, the church was, was packed and there were these big Newfoundland dogs out that, that people had just on their own brought to stand guard out in front of the church. And and this, it was like someone could have wrote a script where there was a fog rolling in, you know, into the harbor and 
and uh, it was a beautiful service. People spoke really well and sang songs. And, and then afterwards, we all went to the Delta, and uh, there was a stage set up, and and uh, so many people got up, and each would sing would sing just two songs uh, of Ron's, and, uh, uh, and it, it 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 was it was really it was really cool. Everybody got up, and nobody nobody repeated the song. It went on for hours. And after that, we all went down to the Ship Inn, which is a very popular uh, music place in, in, in St. John's. And, and played more music there, and I stumbled back to my hotel late that night, and uh, that's the night I. I should mention that, while I was there for a few days, and you could not, you couldn't get into a taxi cab or walk into a, a bar or a, or a, a, a mall or, or even turn on the radio. People were playing his music. His music was everywhere. You couldn't get away from it, which was good, and. Uh, it was like the whole province and city were really mourning the guy. You know, it was it was so nice to, to know that that kind of respect was being shown. And so uh, late that night, when I made back to the hotel, I, I sat down and thought about that whole thing, and and, and the song just kind of spilled out. I've been walking around St. John's tonight like I've been under the spell, cause I feel like a part of him is still here. Making his last farewell. I can hear his voice all over town. In every shopping bar. In every phone call from the way. No matter how near or far. We're saying goodbye to Ron. He is an important artist for, for Newfoundland. He, his debut album came out in uh, 1972. 72 sorry um, but early and but it was the very first record of all original music by a Newfoundland artist yeah. for that all traditional yeah so he kind of broke big ground for uh, Newfoundland artists and songwriters in in Newfoundland which we we've, we've had quite a few but yeah. Ron Ron was king for sure and he was an influence on on me he's older than I I was so when I was a kid. I was I looked up to his work and I learned his work, some of his very early work. And it was funny because later years we became friends and we're we were down downtown Charlottetown one night, uh, cruising around a little bit and we we're walking up the street and and out of the blue I just started singing one of his very first very first songs. He had no clue that I knew. You know, back back home on the island, people are remembering a better day. You know, and he looks at me like he couldn't believe I know this. You know, <laughs> early songs as, as I he was uh he was a force in nature quite a personality <laughs> oh yeah uh, could be cantankerous uh, right <laughs> he could be cantankerous i never ever had a problem with ron we always got along great but i know some stories he had a huge heart but yeah he, he could be a he could be something somebody to deal with and be uh, a handful but such a great talent anyway that i yes i gave you another easy one <laughs> they're probably not all going to be that easy though Okay, track number three. For something totally different. It sounds familiar, like I know I've heard that voice, but I can't tell you who it is. Yeah, you probably know why I would play this Middle Eastern music for you because of your travels there. Um, so the the artist is Yair Dalal. He's an Israeli oud player, um, but he has worked and and recorded with the Bedouin tribes. So okay. he's uh, being a real proponent of bringing their music to the recorded world and and to the world at large. Yeah. And um, it's beautiful stuff. Like yeah, well, it's like very it. ancient instruments. And uh, I just I picked it for you, Lenny, because I know you know your 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 song "Meet Me at the Oasis" uh, has you know influences of of your time in the Middle East. So maybe just talk about your travels there and how that expanded your musical world. Well, <clears throat> um, yeah. I, well, I ended up in the in the uh, uh, Negev Desert with Bedouin and in Sinai Desert as well with Bedouin tribesmen 
my, my friend Roy Johnson, who I was traveling with, we, we jumped on the boat and slept on the deck of the boat going across the Mediterranean, Went ended up going to Cyprus and then Israel. And I called my friends up in Israel that I met and they were so excited that I had been there and we hung up there for a while and then went down into the Negev desert and, and then continued on down into Egypt because I had friends in, in, in Egypt. And on the way there, we went to the Sinai and I met uh, uh, a couple of people there who introduced me to some Bedouin tribesmen. And so we went into the desert with Bedouin tribesmen for a while. And that was an amazing uh, trip, uh, fantastic uh, images that always stayed with me. And, uh, uh, and and it was a very interest time, interesting time to be there because uh, Israel had, a, had just given the section of the Sinai back to Egypt, and yet they wanted to hang on to a two-mile corridor and Egypt, Egypt didn't want that to happen and so late at night there were all these military helicopters flying around in the dark it was a very tense time and we, when we tried to come out of the desert my friend Roy and I actually left the Bedouins and we were taken out at gunpoint by guards and they were questioning wow. us and it got pretty heavy for a little while and, but in the end uh, uh, I just had wonderful memories of being there and the people that I met and everything and the experiences that I had, and, and uh, that song kind of grew up with me at the Oasis, you know. Is there any other world music styles that, that, that you're particularly influenced by or that you love? I listen to world music a lot, you know. I, I particularly love uh, East Indian music, uh, and that's that uh, uh, Ali Khan, Fatih Ali Khan. I listen to his stuff. Uh, I really like what Rai Cooter has done with some East Indian and African uh, players uh, in some of his catalog. I, I tend to listen to uh, quite a bit of world music. I love Celtic, of course, in, in all forms of Celtic, you know, whether derivations of thereof, of that stuff as well. So. Okie doke, uh, we're already at track number four. Well, interestingly enough, the person who's singing, his niece, uh, is sitting across the room from me right now, so I think I know that song. My partner, Patricia Zott, is singing, Angel Arsenal. It's funny you chose that because because I've played on that song many times with Patricia. Angela Asno is from Prince Edward Island yeah. and grew up right where I am, where I'm speaking to you from, actually. So you couldn't get much closer to, to, to where I'm at. <laughs> and, and she uh, she's an extremely well-known, iconic uh, songwriter in, Acadia, in the Acadian world. And when she broke onto the scene, she was living up in Quebec and she became a massive uh, music star in Quebec. She, her, her stuff just took off and she she was really a superstar in Quebec for, for, for quite a while and uh, then she moved back east after, after things quieted down she moved back east and she continued to write right up until she passed she, she passed now a few years back and, uh, and it has left a really strong strong mark on, on, on the Acadian world and Acadian music like so many people have recorded her songs and done covers of her songs and very prolific very she really had a great knack for melody and putting melody together, you know, catchy songs that, and, and and play with words in a very unique way, and and really represented the reason the region where she comes from in such a such a, an amazing fashion. She she always be a superstar among the Acadian people. Now you got Patricia all emotional over here. <laughs> <laughs> she she loved Angel so much, and they wrote songs together, and she sings a lot of her songs. Oh, well, I picked it for both of you. Yeah, I, I saw that there was a connection with Patricia and, and Angel. Um, your Acadian roots, Lenny, and that you've embraced your Acadian roots, you actually learned to speak French in your 20s because you didn't grow up speaking French. That's yeah. Not, no. That's not an easy task to learn a language as an adult. No, and I'm still, I still work at it. Uh, where I'm at right now is the Acadian part of Prince Edward Island that was able to hang on to their language because they're a little more, a little more isolated back, you know, uh, when I was growing up. Um, whereas I, I came from a small Acadian community that was dead center of Prince Edward Island, 
right next to Cavendish, which was of course the major tourist center and a couple and a few miles from Charlottetown with uh, English villages all around us, surround us. So hanging on to the language uh, it was, it was harder when, you know, uh, and uh, it was lost around the time of my, uh, my grandparents started losing it. Three of my four grandparents spoke French as their first language. My parents speak English with a French, a slight French accent, but they can't speak a word of French. And uh, even, and, which is kind of the community I grew up in. Very few families still spoke French when I was growing up. There were a few. Uh, and I never really, I, I think I, I didn't totally grasp the whole uh, history of the Acadian and our culture. We lived the culture, but we didn't really get get you know what it was all about in some ways because the language was gone. It wasn't until I started hanging out with Acadians in Bay St. Marie and, and up here in Mont Carmel area that I really started to understand it. And uh, and at that point, I decided I was going to try to get the language back and, and made an effort to do so, as you say, in my 20s, really, and uh, ended up uh, getting it back to the point I recorded now three albums in French, wrote and wrote, wrote and all original songs. Yeah, um, so it's been a process, you know. Well, I really enjoyed your Acadian tunes. Uh, Open Window was maybe the first one. Yeah, it's got a it's got kind of a Cajun feel to it. A lot a lot of people don't know, of course, the Cajuns of Louisiana are Acadians who were deported, you know, and and ended up down there, and so they have Acadian history. Uh, I always say to people, oh, they didn't they didn't know that. I said, well, you know, if you're in Bay Saint Marie in Saint Mary's Bay in Nova Scotia, and you you say I'm an Acadian, you know, if you said that in French, you would say je suis Acadien, but if you said it in Bay Saint Marie dialect, you would say moi je suis Ah. So you can see where the word Cajun came from. Speaking of Louisiana and Cajun music. <laughs> Degrapon, is it? Uh, is it Degrapon? No, it's. Uh, oh, who is it? I should I should know that. It's a duo fiddle. Uh, Alfour. Uh, no, but they're they're all from the same area, so I'm sure they all sound similar, right? Joel Sa Savoy and Lindsay Young. So you know the probably the Savoys, right? Mark and Anne. It's Mark and Anne's son, Joel. Yeah, I've actually played with Joel. I think. Joel, yeah, he's lovely, hey? He's a wonderful player. Um, I just, I love the stripped down duo fiddle thing. Like, I think that's a real Cajun uh, tradition to do dual fiddles. And Lindsay is from the Red Stick Ramblers, another pretty high profile band. Joel is in the Red Stick Ramblers with, with Lindsay. Yeah. And Lindsay's a young guy, but man, he sounds like he's being. I don't know. He sounds so traditional. Like when I heard that first, when I first heard them, I'm like, that's an older guy singing, but it's not. Oh yeah. It sounds really. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah so it's called Madame Young. Uh, it's from a 2008 recording of them. And uh, just, and when, when you hear Cajun versus Acadian music, like what, what is the difference? Like, I think they get interchangeable. Well, interestingly enough, uh, back when, when I was growing up, Acadian music didn't really sound much like Cajun music. There was a, uh, it was a little more, uh, it didn't have that Cajun uh, 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 rhythm and, and, and uh, groove, you know, but as soon, but uh, in the last few decades, there's been a lot of cross pollination between Acadian musicians and Cajun musicians. And now the Cajun sound has made its way up into uh, Acadia. And there are a lot of Acadian bands who actually play music that has all that Cajun feel and that Cajun uh, groove and, and, and sound. I, you know, the, the Cajun stuff down there sort of got mixed up with blues and folk and, 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 and I think even some, uh, possibly some Caribbean stuff, you know, and everything. And it all, got, it all 
well, the Creole was a little more into the, in, you know, involved in that, but it's a bit of a melange, you know. Yeah, it just shows you what a global world. Um, I think I've enjoyed that in the world music scene of watching so much fusion come about, you know, like so many world music bands have band members from all different parts of the globe and they, they mix their music together, which is really interesting. Okay, well, we're at the last tune, Lenny. <laughs> And going back to a little bit more world music for you. That's a, it's either a, either black on Pelosi or is it black on Pelosi? Well, that wasn't too hard. <laughs> it's not too hard since I've actually played with those guys. Yeah, they're, and I've, we've had them in the series at CAP before, so they're favorites of ours too. Um, beautiful artists. You're aware that we did a song together. Yes, I, I played Black Flo Yes, so tell me about your, your collaboration with Black and Flozy. Well, it was very interesting how that happened because I was just finishing my, my mixes for time travel uh the last english album uh and uh, I, I ran into their their canadian agent on the street and uh, he said what are you up to i said well i'm just finishing mixes I said, would you like to hear a couple so he sat in my truck with me and we were playing some of my mixes and he said oh by the way he said this band from uh, zimbabwe that i represent they're coming to uh canada on tour and uh, they got a few days off on PEI. They played here before PEI, but they have a few days off and they're looking for a place to stay. And would you know where they might be able to crash for a few days? Because you're always trying to, you know, they're, they're trying to save a few dollars while they're... And I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm renting a cottage on the North Shore. I said, Dick, take my cottage. I'll go stay with my girlfriend. And, uh, and uh, he said, well, that would be fabulous. He said, well, maybe... Uh, uh, maybe you guys could do something together while they're down. And I said, well, that would be amazing. I said, I know who they were. And I said, that would be awesome, but I don't you know what we would do. What, what could we do? And I thought, well, maybe I could write a song. And so I, I thought, uh, I think it'd be cool to write a Christmas song for them. And, and so in the middle of a heat wave in July, I, I wrote a Christmas song. And then I ended up running into a friend of mine who owns, who has cottages right on the beach on the North Shore. It's an amazing place called Golden Sands, if you're ever looking for a place on BEI. And uh, I told her their predicament and she said, oh, I'll give them a couple. She gave them a couple of cottages free of charge, which was awesome. And, and the guys were, the guys were beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, guys to work with. And, and so we ended up going to a friend of mine's uh, photography barn with a little recording outfit and we recorded the song and did a video for the song all in one day. Hallelujah. A tale to teach oh, oh, how to give love oh, a child to lead oh, like a star above on Christmas day we open the gift of love and hope and light a candle for the lost and homeless Sing a hymn for the birth of Jesus Unlock the doors and the windows Let love and kindness all flow Light a candle for the hungry child Sing a hymn for the birth On Christmas Day Ring the bells On planet Earth Joy to the world We celebrate ah, 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 A simple birth wonderful collaborations it's the harmonies are just otherworldly aren't they oh they're they're so amazing and, and uh, just wonderful uh, wonderful people to work with they've been together since 1982 wow you know they lost one of the members eh? yeah 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 but uh, yeah they're they're uh, just that was, that was a a really neat turn in my life and one of those uh uh, little lessons I learned to always just just go with the flow and just say yes you know you know if somebody says you know a place where they could stay yeah I'll get them a place <laughs> you know and so it kind of worked out well anyway. you know there's one story I did want to get from you before we leave today and it was from your time at the Vancouver Folk Festival I believe okay. don't you have a ghost story from the, the Folk Festival experience 
I've got some go. Oh, yes, I do. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, my it's song. Not to put you on the spot, but you do like you have a lot of you have you have some ghost stories in that in your songs, and I know you you. Yeah, I think I'm a little. Bit, those things. I think I'm a little bit of a ghost magnet. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've had some crazy experiences, and uh, someday if you got a couple of hours, I'll tell you about some of them. But but one of them. Uh, this isn't necessarily the most uh, intense experience, but it was a case for many years. Uh, my, I wrote a song about uh, uh, a ghost ship that supposedly sails the waters. I'm, I'm actually looking over the computer at the at the, the water that supposedly the ship sails on right now, the Northumberland Strait. Wow. Uh, and uh, for many years, the people had talked about how uh, 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 there was a fire ship that would appear on occasion. People would see this fire ship, this three-masted square rigger that would sail these waters between PEI and the mainland. And when I was a, when I wrote songs for my very first album, I thought that was a kind of an interesting little piece of folklore. So I wrote a song about it called Tales of the Phantom Ship and never really thought anything about this song possibly, you know, you know about the weight of it. I just thought it was a colorful story, you know. But I got to tell you, like, since I've written that song, people have come up to me and and tell me stories about seeing that ship and especially when I was doing my uh, my multimedia show which was all about PEI people would come up to me after the show and they would very seriously tell me about seeing this fire ship and they all described it the same three masted square rigger all the flame I'm now up to 101 people who claim to have seen this ship and described oh it very distinctly but anyway that's not the story the story is is that when we started playing this song uh, and I had a band at that point. I was playing with a five-piece band, and I had a, a violin player in my band, Janet Munson, who you may remember. Very great violin player. And uh, she was, I always thought Janet was a little otherworldly, and she doesn't mind me telling this story. She, she seems like sometimes she came from another planet or something, but she had this connection with the universe, you know. Anyway, we started playing this um, every time, not every time, but almost every time we'd play, three times lights fell on stages, we lost power in a number of theaters during that song. When, when we played it outside, we had wind storms, hail storms, lightning storms show up. We lost power and uh, we played it in Rustico, my annual Rustico show in a big tent. We lost power in the middle of that song, which happened in theaters as well. Uh, I could go on and on about the crazy thing. It got to the point I was afraid of the song and I would I, I, I would only ever play the song. It was the very, very last song of the evening in case something strange would happen. And and uh, so we always do that song as the last encore because I never knew what was going to happen. Sometimes you'd be ready for it and nothing would happen. And then the next show, something bizarre would go on. Like Janet said, when we lost power in, in, the, in the big tent in, in Rustico, she said in the darkness, she said she could sense people all around her and they were talking to her in, in another language. Uh, gathered around. So with all these stories like this, and so we go to Vancouver, and we're playing the Vancouver Festival. And this was this was early on before I I necessarily even believed it was true. Like there was bizarre things happening when we played this song. And uh, it was a dark day. It hadn't rained yet. It was just dark, and the clouds were always dark. And uh, at that point, the song was kind of it was a popular song of mine. So I decided to open my set my set with it. And we got on stage and uh, we started we, we started to play the song. We got into the third or fourth bar of the song because uh, I start with a really wail and a harmonica and da, 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 all these screams. And I start singing the song. The whole sound system went dead. Oh, no. The sound system with that song. And, and, <laughs> and we were, yeah, I know. And I'm like, oh, crap, I shouldn't have done that song. We're <laughs> wandering around the stage. They're trying to pick. And that's never happened before in the history of the Vancouver Folk Festival. I don't think the sound system has ever gone down in the middle of a show. And so people are wandering around. They're trying to get the sound system up again. Finally, to get it up again. We start playing the song. And I, I refuse to believe that the song was haunted at that point. Start playing the song again. The skies opened up in the middle of the song. The rain came crashing down and people it was like horrendous downpour and everybody split at a minute and we ended up playing to an empty field and we, we i don't think we could even finish the set because it was raining so hard oh and, and so it was it was crazy a this, damn song. <laughs> song and this went on for for a long time it got to the point like i i, I was so afraid of that song and and uh, 
and I could tell you, I could tell you many, many different stories of things that happened during it. But then Janet left the band after a while. She didn't want to travel anymore. And, uh, and, and that song took its toll, obviously. <laughs> it took its toll, but stuff after she left the band, things, they didn't cease to happen, but they would happen very rarely, you know. So uh, uh, occasionally the odd thing happened, like we have lost power in theater in the middle of that song still, but it's rare now. But I think Janet, magnet, obviously. <laughs> she was the catalyst and, and, and I've talked to her about it. She doesn't mind me telling this story. So I think she was the catalyst for some reason as to all of these things. When she hit the violin, she had a, she had a sound on her violin that would go straight, straight through you, you know, and I think maybe that was calling up some spirits or something. Well, Lenny, it's been awesome to see you. And I look forward to having you back on our stage. My best to Patricia. Thanks everybody for listening. And, uh, and thank you, Fiona, very much. This is called Tales of the Phantom Ship. On a night as black as a raven's feather, thunder crackled like a snap of leather, and the wind whips through the black spruce on the shore. Waves are pounding on the beach as harder as the last of the fishermen who reach safe harbor and the wind turns cold, cuts to the cold. Out on the wide Northumberland Strait, of all the fires kept so the waves and those who watch, they can't believe their eyes. There's a burst of flame and a flash of light and there in the tide is a frightening sight as the tall ship, all the flame lights up the sky. Tales of the phantom ship from to rock the keel in flames She sails the wide Northumberland Strait No one knows her name Tales of the phantom ship It's a ship on fire that can ride Hard against the wind she sails No one can see you are They say she's the three-masted square rigger, four hundred tons, maybe bigger with fire and every rope and spar and sail. Out of the east, though the wind blows west, she plows a straight on an unknown quest, cutting to the waves with the strength of a full pause game. Of why she appears as an one who knows, some say it's nothing but a moonlit glow, but those who've seen her swear they tell no lies. They tell how our bow suddenly drops down And into the depths of the street she's bound And the wind goes wild with the wailing, chilling cries Tales of the phantom ship from to rock the keel in flames She sails the wide Northumberland Strait and no one knows her name Tales of the phantom ship, it's a ship on fire they can fly Hired against the wind she sails, no one can see why Some say she's an immigrant ship of old Highland Scots whose land was stolen Lost at sea, seeking the new land Or a ghostly American privateer Who plundered innocent harbors here Cursed to sail the strait forever damned But an old man sang a song to me Eight hundred Acadian drowned at sea Departed long ago from this here isle he says they sail this choppy street through time and tide they navigate Searching for the means to end their long exile Tales of the phantom ship from to rock to keel and flames She sails the wide Northumberland Strait no one knows her name Tales of the phantom ship, it's a ship on fire they cry Hard against the wind she sails, no one can say why Tales of the phantom ship, from to rock to keel in flames She sails the wide Northumberland Strait, no one knows her name She sails the wide Northumberland Strait, when will she sail again?